Is there anybody in here today that would agree with the statement that's on the board up there? Friday, I heard something from Lincoln that I'd never heard before. Danny said that he's told it to her. And probably Bradley's heard it. Maybe Lisa and Barbie's heard it, but I had never heard it before. We had the kids. Margaret's over on one side of the couch and she's changing the diaper on Lily. And Lincoln's over here on this side of the couch and he wants his grandma. Grandma, come here. Grandma says, I'm busy taking care of Lily. I'll be with you as soon as I'm done changing her. She calls it a wet butt. Lincoln gets up and starts over towards Grandma. And all of a sudden, out of his mouth, I hear, It's not fair. It's not fair. When your kids were little, did they ever get in a fight because somebody wasn't playing fair? He ain't playing fair. Well, listen, we want fair. We want the ump to be fair at the ball game. We want the referee to be fair when he's standing behind the plate. Partiality, we think, has no place in sporting events. I remember when I was on an ambulance run going up to Shelby Valley High School. It was on a Friday evening. There was a football game going on. We got a call that one of the players had been injured, and so we get in the ambulance and we go up there. Well, what had happened, the player had been hurt during a play, so they carried him off of the field and put him on the sideline, and the football game <coughs> continued on. Well, we got there, and... Uh, we were going to transport that injured player to the hospital. The game was already back in progress, and we were getting the player packaged is the word that we always use. You, you either put the neck brace on or put them on a long board or put a foot. Whatever it is they need, you do that before you transport them, and that's called packaging the uh, individual that's going to be transported. Well, while we were packaging that player to transport him, one of the, uh, of the opposing team players, not Shelby Valley, but the other team, and I don't remember which one it was at that time, but one of the other team's players had the football, and he's heading down the field as fast as he can go, going towards the goal line. Well, I remember hearing the announcer over the loudspeaker system. He was talking about the player. He's at the 20, he's at the 25, he's at the 30, he's at the 35. And all of a sudden, except instead of telling where the player was on the field heading towards the goal line, he began to scream to the Shelby Valley players, Get him, boys! <laughs> You know what I thought when he said that? And he didn't say it just once. Get him, boys! Get him! Get him, boys! I thought, how unprofessional. That's not fair to the other team. If it was a Shelby Valley player who had the football who was running towards the goal line, he wouldn't be yelling, Get him, boys! We want announcers to be fair. We want teachers to be fair whenever they grade the tests that are turned in by the students. We want judges to be fair in their decisions, not swayed by politics or by familial influence. Well, that's my uncle's kid, so i got to take it easy on him. We want fair. In this life, we want fair. But you know what? Sometimes life, yeah, life's just not, sometimes life's not fair. We think good people shouldn't suffer problems. And bad people shouldn't get it good. But that's not life. You see, some things bad, sometimes bad things do happen to good people. And good things happen to 
people that aren't good. We've been studying from the book of Judges on Wednesday evenings and we've seen it as long as Israel, under the Old Testament, obeyed God, things went well for them. But lo and behold, whenever Israel disobeyed God, then they had great trouble. That was under the Old Testament. And sometimes we feel like that's the way it ought to be today. If you do right, you ought to have everything you want. No problems. And if you do bad, you, you ought to have all kinds of problems. But, but that's, that's not the way it is. While it is true that sometimes bad things happen to good people, I want us to realize that even when bad things happen, good can come from it. I want us to realize that good can come about even though life throws a monkey wrench in our existence. Let's consider this idea this morning as we study from the Word of God. In more than one passage, we read about the Apostle Paul and what he had to go through for the cause of for the suffering that he went through for the cause of Christ. And in more than one place in the Bible, it is through the pen of the Apostle Paul that, that he talks about the beatings that he had received, the shipwrecks that he had gone through, the night and the day that he had been in the deep, the problems that came to Paul from those who were not members of the Lord's church, who were not Christians. And then remember he added to that that even problems that he had, some of them came from people who were Christians. But then the Apostle Paul writes to us in Romans 8.18, he says, that I reckon, I reckon, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. We live in troubling times. We, we really do. Did you notice now that we've got the Omega variant of the COVID that has invaded the shores of our country? Nobody knows exactly how far it's going to go or what problems it's going to cause. We still have folks suffering from the older COVID and, and dying on a regular basis. In fact, so far in our country, there's been over 777,000 people who have died from COVID. But even in our hard times, God can still bring about good. There are some things we don't understand about God. You heard me mention last week if you were here. I don't know how God does it. But when a person goes down into the water of baptism, while they are buried in that water of baptism, somehow God takes all the sins that that person had committed and takes them away. As Ananias said to Saul of Tarsus, arise and be baptized and wash away. Wash away your sins. God does it whenever a person is baptized. How He does it, I don't know, but God does it. How God is always able to make good from bad, I don't understand all the time. But He can and will do it. The great Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians 3.20, Now unto Him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. He can do exceeding abundantly above even what we think. How He does it, we don't always know. But He does it. I'll be honest with you. Sometimes during hard troubles, it's hard to find the good that's being brought about. Very often we aren't able to see the good of except uh, of a situation except in, in what we'll call it retrospect. After it's over with, then we can see. But while it's happening, we 
oftentimes don't see. Mom and Dad might have prevented us from doing things whenever we were growing up and we thought, man, how unfair it is. Everybody else is doing it. Can I do it? Mom and Dad says no. And we say, that's unfair. You're not fair to me. But then after we grow up, we look back and we say, you know what? Mom and Dad had my best interest at heart. <coughs> it might be that, it, that, that it's going to take until eternity until we're able to see the purpose of some of the problems that we have gone through in this life. Well, let's look at some examples of how bad things can be good to our spiritual lives. Number one, bad things, whenever they happen to us, have a tendency to put us on our knees. And that's a good place to be. David, the psalmist of long ago, had come to that realization of how good is able to come from bad it's in Psalms 119, verse 71. David writes, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. David says, God, whenever there's problems, it draws me closer to thee. I want to learn what you want whenever I have problems in my life. Can problems bring us closer to God? Sure they can. Sometimes we have no prayer life at all as long as everything's going well, but then whenever problems arise, whenever we realize I can't handle this myself, then where do we go? We go to our knees and we go to God. Sure. Let's face it, then it can be good when problems of life drive us to our knees. The Apostle Paul had learned that lesson in 2 Corinthians 12. Paul talks about some type of a physical problem that he had. We're able to read in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 and 8. He says, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Now, number one, realize it didn't come from God. I don't know how many times I've heard preachers during funerals say, the Lord won't put on you more than you can bear. The Bible says that. Well, no, it doesn't. God is faithful who will not permit you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear. Now, that's in the Bible. We are not, God does not put <coughs> bad things upon us. So that statement, God won't put on you more than you can bear. The devil, God won't permit the devil to put on you more than you can bear. Because listen to what Paul says. He says, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. What this thorn in the flesh was, nobody knows for sure. The Bible doesn't tell us, and if the Bible doesn't tell us, then we can't absolutely know what the thorn in the flesh Paul had was. Many think it was poor eyesight because he spoke to the Christians in the city or in the area of land known as Galatia. In Galatians 4.15, he says, if it, if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Why he said that? Well, maybe he had eyesight problems. And the brethren said, I wish I could give you my eyes, Paul, so you could see better. But anyway, whatever the affliction was that Paul had, he prays three times fervently that it be removed from him. He had been driven to his knees with this problem. But even though he prayed, remember what the Lord told him? 2 Corinthians 12, 9. God says to Paul, My grace is sufficient for me. For my strength is made perfect in weakness when we've done all we can. And the results aren't favorable. Turn it over to God. Our Heavenly Father then can be glorified when we turn it over to Him. Because if you turn it over to God, and you become victorious, then God gets the glory in love. Uh, that's why Paul goes on 
and says in the remainder of the verse that we just looked at, he says, back up. Well, I guess I didn't type it in. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ <coughs> may rest upon me. There it is. Yeah. First Thessalonians 5.17, one of the shorter verses in the Bible. It says, pray without ceasing. Certainly, it's during times like we're experiencing now that we rely on prayer. Let's face it, what in the world can you and I do to change the situation of the world or even to change the situation that's going on here in our immediate area? This is a time we need to be driven to our knees. To pray for ourselves, to pray for the church, to pray for the frontliners, to pray for those who have COVID, and to pray that our Heavenly Father brings an end to this horrible thing. Well, might not seem fair when problems hit our lives. We may think our neighbors as ungodly as they get, but he's got it made. And I try my best to live right, and I have all kinds of problems. <laughs> These problems, I tell you what, they can turn into good because they can drive us to our knees to seek the help of the eternal Heavenly Father who loves us with that heavenly love. Another thing we can learn from problems in our lives is patience. Patience is not a natural attribute. Ask Lily. When she gets hungry, who knows it? <laughs> Everybody in the house knows she's hungry. Honey, we're busy right now. We'll fix your bottle in five minutes. You just, you just hang tight. Yeah. You know how well that works. <coughs> patience is not an act. Babies don't have patience. They want what they want at the exact moment that they want. You know what? Sometimes, sometimes we need to learn to sit quietly and patiently. Patience is a Bible word. It is the Greek word hupomene. And it means perseverance, <coughs> endurance. Patience is that wherein we stand and we wait patiently for that to come about that we want. Paul, Paul talked about patience. He wrote in Romans 5, verses 3 and 4, he said, not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. It doesn't sound right, does it? To glory in tribulations. But Paul says we do. We glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh, brings about patience. Patience, experience, and experience hope. we got to come to the conclusion that sometimes we encounter situations that we can't fix. Things beyond our ability to control. When that happens, we need patience heard a saying, I really like it. <coughs> sometimes God calms the storm. But sometimes God just lets the storm rage. And He calms us. When things happen, when life is unfair, God knows what's needed. Just have the patience and the endurance that it takes to leave it in God's hands. Amen. Number three. When life is unfair, it'll remind us to look up. <clears throat> Believe it or not, the world's not perfect. Human life is not perfect. If human life was perfect, we wouldn't desire to go anywhere else, would we? No. We wouldn't want to go to heaven if this place was perfect. We read these inspired words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 4.18. He said, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And then in the very next verse, we are given a very precious promise, 2 Corinthians 5, 1, where he says, for we know that if our earthly house and this tabernacle were dissolved, if we die, 
We have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Paul says, listen, this world's not perfect, but we got something better. A better place to go. It's the place that the Lord is going to prepare for us. Life is not perfect. Life is not fair. But there's a place awaiting the faithful children of God which is perfect. And which is fair. When life doesn't seem fair to you, remember there's something better to go to. Something greater to attain. That wonderful home in heaven prepared for those who have victoriously accomplished the Christian's race. Finally, when life is unfair, <clears throat> let that unfairness prepare us for a greater service. When life is unfair, it permits us to be empathetic with others to whom life is being unfair. When it's hard to make the bills at the end of the month, it's easier to have feelings toward other people who are going through the same thing. If you've got a full pocket full of money and you own half the bank, sometimes it's hard to feel bad about folks who are having financial trouble. But if you're having financial trouble, it's a whole lot easier to feel for those who are going through the same thing. When cancer visits our family, we can appreciate what others who are going through the same are experiencing. I remember when I was an ER nurse and I would be working in the emergency room and somebody would come in and that person had shingles. I've never had shingles. <coughs> whoop de doo you got shingles. Hey, after I got shingles, my feelings changed for people to get, to get and have shingles. When we become empathetic, we begin to look for ways to serve others that have the same problems we do. Let's face it, all of us who are Christians, <coughs> we are to be ministers, but you're the minister. Well, Christians are ministers. Not only the one who stands before you and preaches, not only the song leader who gets up and leads singing, not only the one who leads prayer, but every Christian is to be a minister. Because the word minister means a helper, a comforter. We're all to be that. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all of our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them that are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we are comforted by God. Why does God help us? So we can help others. Thank you. The greatest help we can give is to share the gospel of Christ. Acts 8 verse 4, due to the horrible persecution being leveled on the Christians in the city of Jerusalem by a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus who had become the Apostle Paul. But the Christians in Jerusalem were fearing so much for their lives, you remember that they scattered? And everywhere they went, they went preaching the Word. Yeah, They wanted to share that glorious, soul-saving gospel. Before you were a Christian, what were you? Lost, lost, lost. No chance, was there? If you'd have died in that condition, there would have been no chance for your soul. We need to realize what the Lord has done for us and then share that message with others. Life's unfair at times. But we're able to read this in Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called, the called according to His purpose. <laughs> There is a constant, powerful help for us. Life, life is unfair. We have problems. We feel overburdened at times with the problems of life. Keep looking up. There's a better place. Always remember what we read in Romans 8.18. For I reckon 
that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. When life's unfair, drop to your knees. To a God who loves and cares for you. Let the unfairness of life teach you patience. If you can't fix the problem, give it to God. And then sit back and let Him fix it. He knows best. When life's unfair, keep looking up. There is something better for the faithful. When life is, re is unfair, realize, realize you're not the only person in the world that has that problem. Chances are there's thousands or more who have the same problem. Use it as an opportunity to give empathy to others. And especially realize that Christ died for you and saved you and tell others what He's done for you. Get prepared for that better life. That's what the people did on the day of Pentecost. The Bible tells us there that whenever the Apostle Peter was preaching that he told the people on the day of Pentecost to present gathered there in the city of Jerusalem that they by wicked hands had crucified and slain the very Son of God. And when they realized that, they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent. Change. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Life is unfair. Bad things happen to good people. that all of us will come to the point whenever our lives on this earth are over with. And then the only thing that will matter is have we been obedient to passages like the one on the board. Was there a time whenever we were baptized for the remission of sins? That phrase, for the remission of sins, does not mean because you were already saved. Amen. It means so you can be saved. Amen. Lessons yours. I've gone overboard. I thank you for your patience. But if you're here today and you're not a child of God, make this today. Coming forward, believing that Jesus is the Son of God, making up your mind, I'm going to live for God, not for me anymore. I will confess with my mouth the name of Jesus and then be baptized in order to have my sins washed away. The invitation is yours if you're subject to it. Come while we stand inside. Okay.